Welcome back to Bombastic Nation and Ting and Ting and Ting. I'm Mr. Giant and I'm back with some more vibes for all you. Yes, I am. We're going to go to Africa again and Ting, boy. You know, I'm enjoying these uh, African vibes and Ting. This one here is called Ashanti Empire. Powerful empire, empires in history. You know what I mean? Listen, we hear all kinds of stuff about the Ashanti. As a matter of fact, uh, growing up on the island... Uh, uh, we have the Anansi stories, and, uh, and as I was told, correct me if I'm wrong, but Anansi means spider in a shanty. So, you know, we had all these uh, stories that's got the morals and stuff about Anansi, you know what I mean? And it was the spider that, that told, you know, good morals of stories and stuff like that. So, you know, I want to see what this empire was all about, you know, and I, don't get me wrong, I've studied some about it, but, you know, refresher, refresher time. Let's YouTube and Sim Sima. The Asante Empire was an Akan Empire and Kingdom from 1701 to 1957, in what is now modern day Ghana. It expanded from Ashanti to include the Brong Ahafo region, the snack. central region, eastern region, and western region of present day Ghana, as well as some parts of Ivory Coast and Togo. Due to the empire's military prowess, wealth, architecture, sophisticated hierarchy, and culture, the Ashanti Empire has been extensively studied and has more books written by European, primarily British authors than any other indigenous culture of Sub-Saharan Africa. Starting in the late 17th century, the Ashanti King Osei Tutu and his advisor Okumfo Anoki established the Ashanti Kingdom, with the golden stool of Ashanti as a sole unifying symbol. Osei Tutu oversaw a massive Ashanti territorial expansion building up the army by introducing new organization and turning a disciplined royal and paramilitary army into an effective fighting machine. In 1701, the Ashanti army conquered Dankira, giving the Ashanti access to the Gulf of Guinea and the Atlantic Ocean coastal trade with Europeans, notably the Dutch. The economy of the Ashanti empire was mainly based on the trade of gold and slaves. The army served as the effective tool to procure captives. The Ashanti Empire fought several wars with neighboring kingdoms and lesser organized tribes such as the Fonte. The Ashanti defeated the British Empire's invasions in the first two of the four Anglo-Ashanti Wars, killing British Army General Sir Charles McCarthy and keeping his skull as a gold-rimmed drinking cup in 1824. What? Due to British improvements in weapons technology, burning and looting of the capital Kumasi and final defeat at the Fifth Anglo-Ashanti War, the Ashanti Empire became part of the Gold Coast Colony in January 1, 1902. Today, the Ashanti Kingdom survives as a constitutionally protected, <clears throat> subnational traditional state in union with the Republic of Ghana. The current king of the Ashanti Kingdom is Odumfuo Ose 222 Asante Hing. The Ashanti Kingdom is the home to Lake Basantai, Ghana's only natural lake. The state's current economic revenue is derived mainly from trading in gold bars, cocoa, Cola nuts and agriculture. Etymology and origins. The name Asante means because of war. The word derives from the three words the meaning war and he meaning because of. This name comes from the Asante's origin as a kingdom created to fight the Denkir kingdom. The variant name Ashanti comes from British reports that transcribing Asante as the British heard it pronounced, Ashanti. The hyphenation was subsequently dropped and the name Ashanti remained with various spellings including Ashanti common into the early 20th century. Wow, that I didn't know. So the name evolved sort of, you know what I mean? To what we know today. No, no, you see, when you see, when I keep saying a human is a human, you see the parallels of, uh, you know, like we, we look at Ottoman Empire and, you know, Alexander and stuff and like and even Napoleon they had their wars and stuff but it was more local localized as far as we know because I've heard certain people say that African tribes had come all the way up to Europe and stuff and conquered certain parts I would like I would like to find uh, videos on that specific uh, you know what I mean uh, conquest by Africans because you know you don't really hear much about them you know and it had to be in those times they had kings that conquered lands far from where they are I'm gonna have to look for some of that you know get some more vibe on that between the 10th and 12th centuries AD the ethnic Akan people migrated into the forest belt of southern Ghana and established several Akan states 
Ashanti. Brahmahafo. Asim Dankira Fonte Confederacy Nankesim Kingdom. Akim Akwamu Akwe Kwahu, and Ahanta Alan Sefriwasa. Before the Ashanti Kingdom had contact with Europeans, it had a flourishing trade with other African states due to the Ashanti gold wealth. Trade with European states began after contact with the Portuguese in the 15th century AD. When the gold mines in the Sahel started to play out, the Ashanti Kingdom rose to prominence as the major player in the gold trade. At the height of the Ashanti Kingdom, the Ashanti people became wealthy through the trading of... You know something we don't think about? That while the slave trade was going on, there was thriving African countries ruled by Africans. And uh, they, 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 their slave trade consists of places they conquer and they enslave. Uh, some people have told me uh, in my comment section on another video about the British ending uh, the slave trade that even Europeans were enslaved by them, which is, wouldn't be too far-fetched because if they enslave their own people, then of course they're going to enslave anybody else that's, that comes in their way. You know what I mean? But uh, they're thriving over there. So the whole time that the, the, the ship slaves, they're here, they got great kingdoms, they're chilling. That's crazy. You know, and that's the thing. I know it to a certain degree, but it's not really taught in school that they had tri thriving, thriving civilizations there, kings and stuff like that. And they didn't try to like stop the people. As a matter of fact, they actually gave them slaves. A human is a human. Greed will make a human do anything, even to his own people. That's crazy. I couldn't do it. Too human for that. The gold mined from their territory. History. Foundation. Ashanti political organization was originally centered on clans headed by a paramount chief or a manheen. One particular clan, the Oyoko, settled in the Ashanti subtropical forest region, establishing a center at Kumasi. The Ashanti became tributaries of another Akan state, Dankira, but in the mid-17th century the Oyoko under Chief Odia Kenton started consolidating the Ashanti clans into a loose confederation against the Dankira. The introduction of the Golden Stool was a means of centralization under Osei Tutu. According to legend, a meeting of all the clan heads of each of the Ashanti settlements was called just prior to declaring independence from Dankira. In this meeting the Golden Stool was commanded down from the heavens by Okumfo Anoki, chief priest or sage advisor to Asante Hino Se Tutu I and floated down from the heavens into the lap of Osei Tutu I. Okumfo Anoki declared the stool to be symbolic of the new Asante Union, and allegiance was sworn to the stool and to Osei Tutu as the Asante Hino. The newly declared Ashanti Union subsequently waged war against and defeated Dankira. The stool remains sacred to the Ashanti as it is believed to contain the sunsum, spirit or soul of the Ashanti people, independence. In the 1670s the head of the Oyoko clan, Osei Kofi Tutu I, began another rapid consolidation of Akan peoples via diplomacy and warfare. King Osei Kofu Tutu I and his chief advisor, Okumfo Kwame Frimpong Anoki led a coalition of influential Ashanti city-states against their mutual oppressor, the Dankira who held the Ashanti kingdom in its thrall. The Ashanti kingdom utterly defeated them at the Battle of Fayias, proclaiming its independence in 1701. Subsequently, through hard-lined force of arms and savoir faire diplomacy, the duo induced the leaders of the other Ashanti city-states to declare allegiance and adherence to Kumasi, the Ashanti capital. From the beginning, King Osei Tutu and Priest Anoki followed an expansionist and an imperialistic provincial foreign policy. According to folklore, Okumfo Anoki is believed to have visited Agona Akrafonso under Osei Tutu. Realizing the strengths of a loose confederation of Akan states, Osei Tutu strengthened centralization of the surrounding Akan groups and expanded the powers of the judiciary system within the centralized government. This loose confederation of small city states grew in. See, and that's the, it's, it's really odd to hear. And you know it to be true. You know it was there. 
but you know and i don't know how it is like elsewhere but like in this region they just make them seem like savages you know what i mean it's savages to the point where you don't think they have organized governments you know what i mean and, and systems or you know it's just it's just not taught they are a centralized government they have this they have that you know what i mean they were organized they were, you know but the portrayal of them especially in this area this region here is that they're just running wild without any kind of a organization or anything you know just warlike you know all they want to do is kill 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 you know what i mean and then they'll eat people you know and stuff like that but they actually you know and, and I said, like, I knew this, but, you know, just the, the fact that, I mean, they, they didn't really, did they teach that in schools back home? Or I, I don't remember. That was the 70s, well, not so much the 70s, but, yeah, the late 70s, early 80s, all you heard was about the farming in Ethiopia and stuff like that, you know? And all the pictures we see about uh, kids with big bellies and bald heads and they're all starving. But they were thriving, you know, they had governments and stuff. ...into a kingdom and eventually an empire looking to expand its borders. Newly conquered areas had the option of joining the empire and becoming tributary states. A poker where I, Osei Tutu's successor, extended the borders, embracing much of Ghana's territory. European Contact European contact with the Asante on the Gulf of Guinea coast region of Africa began in the 15th century. This led to trade in gold, ivory, slaves, and other goods with the Portuguese, which gave rise to kingdoms such as the Ashanti. On May 15, 1817, the Englishman Thomas Bowditch entered Kumasi. He remained there for several months, was impressed, and on his return to England wrote a book, Mission from Cape Coast Castle to Ashanti. His praise of the kingdom was disbelieved as it contradicted prevailing prejudices. Joseph Dupuy, the first British consul in Kumasi, arrived on March 23, 1820. Both Bowditch and Dupuy secured a treaty with the Asante Heen. But, the governor, Hope Smith, did not meet Ashanti expectations. Slavery Slavery was historically a tradition in the Ashanti Empire, with slaves typically taken as captives from enemies in warfare. The Ashanti Empire was not only the largest slave-owning state in the territory of today's Ghana but also the largest trader in the region to supply the Atlantic slave trade. The welfare of their slaves varied from being able to acquire wealth and intermarry with the master's family to being sacrificed in funeral ceremonies. The Ashanti believed that slaves would follow their masters into the afterlife. Slaves could sometimes own other slaves, and could also request a new master if the slave believed he or she was being severely mistreated. The modern-day Ashanti claim that slaves were seldom abused, and that a person who huh. abused a slave was held in high contempt by society. They defend the humanity of Ashanti slavery by noting that those slaves were allowed to marry. If a master found a female slave desirable, he might marry her. He preferred such an arrangement to that of a free woman in a conventional marriage, because marriage to an enslaved woman allowed the children to inherit some of the father's property and status. Nevertheless, the occurrence of slave sacrifices in the Ashanti Empire paints a rather different picture than the supposed humane slavery claimed by apologists. This favored arrangement occurred primarily because of what some men considered their conflict with the matrilineal system. Under this kinship system... You know, some people would... would uh... Con contradict this and go you know oh that's just painting them this way or that way but the point is the human if they, 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 they if they could gain wealth on the backs of cheap labor it doesn't matter what color you are it doesn't matter what nationality you are it doesn't matter what religion you are if you could get rich off of cheap labor or free labor you're going to take it Especially if you can overpower and conquer people, you're going to do it. You know what I'm saying? doesn't matter what color you are. That's why we have to learn from it because, you know, we do it to ourselves before we do it to others. At some point, we're going to have to come to grips with that. You know what I'm saying? It's like I've heard stories about, you know, Africans selling other Africans into slavery and stuff. But that part was never emphasized 
You know what I mean? It, it was just like an afterthought. However, that still doesn't make it right for anybody else to do it. You know what I'm saying? We got to start treating each other because in order to make somebody a slave, you have to dehumanize them. And how could you look at a human and dehumanize the human to the point where you own him? You know, like they conquered the people and they, they own them. That's why it's so hard in these modern times. Even in these modern times, man, you conquer somebody. That's the feeling, you know what I mean? You're working for somebody else, pretty much. Because they're going to come in and take the natural resources and stuff like that. And that becoming a victim of that is hard to overcome. And it lasts for generations, you know? But there comes a point in, in, in life when you have to go, we got to live for the here and now. Let's make this better. Those mistakes not make it again or make it less i don't know how you could curtail greed because greed has a have a lot to do with it you know what i mean how do you curtail greed you know you live in a very uh, materialistic world everybody wants the bugatti and, and the maserati you know what i mean and step on others to get to it there's slavery today because people want to keep all the wealth to themselves, you know what I mean? Children were considered born into the mother's clan and took their status from her family. Generally, her eldest brother served as mentor to her children, particularly for the boys. She was protected by her family. Some Ashanti men felt more comfortable taking a slave girl or pawn wife in marriage, as she would have no abusua to intercede on her behalf when the couple argued. With an enslaved wife, the master and husband had total control of their children, as she had no kin in the community. British Relations In December 1895, the British left Cape Coast with an expeditionary force. It arrived in Kumasi in January 1896 under the command of Robert Baden Powell. The Asante Heen directed the Ashanti to not resist, as he feared a genocide. Shortly thereafter, Governor William Maxwell arrived in Kumasi as well. Britain annexed the territories of the Ashanti and the Fonti and constituted the Ashanti Crown Colony on September 26, 1901. Asante Heen Ajiman Prempe was deposed and arrested, and he and other Ashanti leaders were sent into exile in the Seychelles. The Asante Union was dissolved. Didn't the Seychelles like a really British nice? British resident was permanently placed in the city of Kumasi, and soon after a British fort was built there. Uprisings of 1900 and since 1935. As a final measure of resistance, the remaining Asante court not exiled to the Seychelles mounted an offensive against the British residents at the Kumasi fort. The resistance was led by Asante Queen Ya Asantawa, Queen Mother of Ajisu. From March 28 to late September 1900, the Asante and British were engaged in what would become known as the War of the Golden Stool. In the end, the British were victorious, they exiled Asantawa and other Asante leaders to the Seychelles to join Asante King Prempe I. In January 1902, Britain finally designated the Ashanti Kingdom as a protectorate. The Ashanti Kingdom was restored to self-rule on January 31, 1935. Ashanti King Prempe II was restored in 1957, and the Ashanti Kingdom entered a state union with Ghana on independence from the United Kingdom. Uh. Whoa, that just stopped. What was that? Let's go back. Why did that just stop? Let's see what's going on here. But anyway, oh, did that just... Uh, that, that just stopped right there. Boom. 35. Asante King Prempe II was restored in 1957, and the Ashanti Kingdom entered a state union with Ghana on independence from the United Kingdom. Take care of each other, all right? Cool runnings.